thanks for joining me here in my uh, my shop. Um, what I'm going to do with this radio now is I'm going to try to operate it on the AM band. I'm going to pump in a signal from the signal generator up here. Try to get something to come out of the speaker and then determine whether or not the distortion is occurring just the same as what's happening on the FM side. And that's going to help me localize where trouble might be in the uh, in the radio. So that's my goal. It's also an interesting opportunity to finally actually receive something with the AM side of this radio because I don't think I've received a single thing yet with it. But first, let me show you something you might find interesting here. And uh, so my wife and I went out for a drive yesterday and we drove approximately 400 million years back in time from here. Yeah, really. The area I live in here, the town of Aurelia, and this whole whole area of southern Ontario, a large area, is really glacial debris left on the ground after the glaciers receded 10,000 years ago. So if you were here, say 11,000 years ago, uh, this area would look nothing like it does now, and you could probably see a mile-high wall of ice about... Uh, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 miles north of here, somewhere in this range. I'm sure you can't specify the exact point of the glacial, glacier that was around for, I don't know, a million years or something like that. Anyway, it only left 10,000 years ago. So if we drive north from here, we can cross from the debris field that I live in. Um, and by the way, what does glacial debris look like? It's a bunch of uh, gravel. There's lots of gravel around here, and especially boulders of all sizes, uh, roundish boulders like this, and up until really quite large boulders too, all rounded off because they got underneath the uh, glacial glacier and the glacier did something, uh, ground them down or whatever it did to them to turn them into round stones. They're everywhere around here. Every farmer's field has a huge pile of these round boulders at the edge that had to be cleared away. I got boulders in my backyard, they're everywhere. So I live in the glacial debris, but just driving north about, uh, I don't know, was it 20 miles? Not even 20 miles. We cross out of the glacial debris area and into the scoured area where the debris basically came from. It was pushed down by the glaciers as I understand it. And here's why. I, I went there because they really, really do travel back in time to 400 million years ago. That's about 100 million years after the very first single cellular life uh, developed on Earth. So during the first hundred million years of life, a few things developed in, uh, in seas. And yes, there was a sea here, a salt water, shallow, warm sea for millions and millions of years before the glaciers appeared, long before the glaciers appeared. In fact, I think it was probably a series of glacial periods between then and now. So after a hundred million years, what do you get living there? You get this. You get this. Here's another one. Here, I'll give you a close-up view of them here. I'll give you a better close-up view in a second. So these are fossils, which we drove to an area where there's known to be fossils. And I, I think, basically, you can find fossils all over the place. Let's take a closer look at this, and I'll tell you what they are. Then we'll get back to uh, working on the radio. So here's a closer look at it. Okay. Almost looks like ribs here, but they're not. They're not ribs. There was nothing that had ribs on the planet at this time. At, at this time, there was uh, animal life in the seas and plant life in the seas, and there may have been some plant life on the ground. I don't really know for sure. I'm not an expert in this stuff by any means. So, what would ever be like this? This is this thing I'm holding is 400 million years old, maybe 350 million, something in that range. It's, I mean, it can't be absolutely specific, but for millions, tens of millions of years, these things were common. I can give you a hint. It stood this way. It stood this way. Vertical. What is it? It's a crinoid. And that, you know, again, I'm not an expert at this. I'm just poking around having some fun here. It's a crinoid. It's a plant. And what you're seeing there is the stem of the plant. And uh, how it gets these ribs, I don't know exactly. <clears throat> of course, being a fossil, this is all mineralized now. This one's actually cooler looking. So when I first found this, I thought, oh my god, I found a, a ribbed animal. But it's not. It's just a, uh, it's just what happens to a plant, this kind of plant. So 
Pretty cool, eh? So, you think the radio's old I'm working on? Hey, this is really, really old. And I'm lucky in a way. There's not many places in the world where you can walk on the ground that's 400 million years old and pick up stuff like this. Where did I find this? We parked our car. This is a, this is a un, <coughs> un, uh, uncared for area. It's not a park or anything like that. It's just the end of a road. It's actually the end of the end of a road. Uh, just, just ends in the woods, basically. Or not really woods there. It's kind of, kind of rocky there. And I got out and we went for a walk, uh, ten minutes, and came back to the truck. I had a couple things in my hand that I'm not showing you. I looked down where I parked the truck, and the parking lot was full of this kind of stuff. I parked on top of this kind of stuff. I just bent down and just picked this up and a couple other things, and off we went. So. Uh, isn't that something? So I got to go back there and explore this much more thoroughly because, as it turns out, I really didn't go to the spot that's famous for fossils. I actually stopped short of it. I would have had to drag my wife for a two-kilometer walk through the woods, and she wasn't too excited about doing that. You got to fight mosquitoes and things like that. So uh, there we go. Anyway, back to the radio now. Back to the radio. So, I'm not a fossil nut, I just like to know a little bit about, you know, I figure you know, if you know a little bit about something, you're way ahead from knowing nothing about it. So I'm happy that, you know, this area provides me with certain opportunities to do things. I'm learning about the uh, native history around here, or the Indians, how they live and stuff like that. It's fascinating. It's nothing like what certainly was alluded to me when I was a kid. The, the truth is, the truth is very different. Anyway, now, I got everything ready to go here, I'm pretty sure. I've got the signal generator running. It's right around 1200, so it's uh, the upper part of the AM band. I'm going to switch on the radio. It's set to FM. We'll make sure it's FMing as, as good as it does. And then we'll switch to AM and see if we can pick up this, uh, this signal. And what just happened here? do that. This uh, frequency counter, like most of them, can, can give you a count of the frequency peaks, give you the frequency, which is the number of peaks per second, or it can give you the time between peaks if you want that. So I just always have it set like this. So. Hmm. Oh well, everything's getting older. So the radio's on, is it? Did I forget? Yes, the radio's on. FM, let's turn it up. There it is, sounding just the same as it did before. So. standing in front of you the whole time. Okie doke. Let's go to AM. Good. So the capacitor is not shorted right now. It's actually, you see, you can see it. Oh, you can't see it. You cannot see it. You cannot see it. Okay, a little awkward for me, but I'm going to have to put this over here. Let's try that. That's not too bad. Wow, okay, well that sounds really good to me. I, I'm sure this is going to work. Now, I've got the radio tuned to 1200. Frequency generator running at 1200. Not quite lined up. Let's line them up here. Output level is medium here. Come on, radio. Oh boy. It's definitely set around 1200. Well, that's certainly not a good, a good, good deal. Let's turn up the level here. It turned very high. Wow. That's, that's enough, actually. The whole test has succeeded. If you watch the scope now. You can see where the, uh, let me put the zero line right in the middle here. 
Okay, so the zero line is right in the middle. You would expect an E uh, signal, uh, you know, a radio signal, to move this equally above and below. So that looks fairly equal there. Okay, even though you're looking at it from a distance, let me just uh, tune in the uh, signal here. And you see, all it's doing is going down. There's nothing going up. In fact, you can see it very clearly. There's virtually a, a cutoff line across here. So the distortion is occurring already. Now let's fiddle with the tone control here. Just Not that I can imagine that would ever affect this. It can't. But once in a while, once in a while, I'm wrong about things. <laughs> So that shows you, shows me, that the, uh, both the AM and the FM are producing the same distorted result. Now that's kind of interesting because the FM detector is quite different than the AM detector. Different circuits are used. And yet both of them are producing this result, or, or they're not producing this result. The result is the same from either detector. So my guess is the signals coming out of the detector is fine. It's something beyond the detector. Yet I thought I looked at that. Hmm. So let's see. I've looked at the input to the volume control, which is normally the output of the detectors. And uh, what did I see there? It was yesterday and I can't remember now. So let's go back and take a look. So we can continue to use the, uh, the tone here, in fact, and the AM. Notice how weak the AM is. Both the AM and FM are very weak. The uh, tuning capacitor, you know, I, I don't really know what happened to it, but I'm guessing somebody got in there and fixed it. And it could be that they were also fixing the IF in this radio, and the result is not much signal getting through the IF anymore. That would be my guess. Uh, let's just take a look. Uh, input to the volume control. I had that figured out yesterday, didn't I? I have that figured out. Input. I'm looking at all this, this crazy network that's up here. Take it right from the output on the, the slider. That's where we'll start again. So I'm just going to ground my lead there. And uh, we'll go on the slider here. What the? What? be better if I move the scope leads and not the signal generator leads. Uh, that would be a smarter move. Yeah, I just fed the signal generator right into the audio. You know, now that's that's not invalid. Except it was a radio signal. That's kind of surprising, isn't it? I fed a radio signal right into the top of the volume control and out came the modulation. That's cur curious in itself, but I'm not going to ignore that. So we're back on the radio input like we should be on the antenna. Oh, for crying out loud. Look where I'm looking. And the scope is still connected to the same point, which is the input to the volume control. So this is the input to the volume control. It doesn't even look right here. Still looks cut off at the top. So somewhere, somewhere, the detector itself seems to be doing this. Okay. Um, boy, if I have another one of those tubes, E A B C eighty. Wow. I, I don't know. If I got one of those. I'm gonna check into that.
because a tube swap might 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 be the best thing to do at this point than to continue you know trying to hunt down component problems and voltage level problems and stuff like that let me see if I've got one of these tubes okay very good I've got three 68s here to work with I got quite a few of these tubes in fact so uh, you can see it looks very similar. I'll show you the one that's in there as soon as I uh, pop it out. So let's switch off here. How hot is that tube? <laughs> Not hot. So if we take a look at the uh, EABC80 inside, I can see that there's like three, looks like three little cans in there, three little tubes inside there, and this guy looks exactly the same. Except look at the difference in the height of the glass uh, tube, which I don't think means anything. The inside parts are identical. Okay, so we'll pop this guy in. Let me just double check. It's a 6T8. Very good. Let's stick them in here. A lot of these uh, tubes, um, the T8 tubes, are 19 T8s. Oh my gosh, it's just about impossible to do that. So in particular, as I mentioned before, you know, muttered before, the uh, particular kind of, uh, of uh, tube socket is just this flat plate kind. It's the worst. To, Trying to blindly put a tube in. Even when I'm looking at it, I'm having trouble here. There it goes. Wow. Hopefully that's the toughest thing I do all day today. Now, the new 6T8 and everything connected, we should be able to see on the scope pretty quickly what the uh, result is. So let's fire it up. I got no idea if this tube is good even. I haven't tested it. So I am looking at it. Let's see if the heaters come on. Yeah, I see some heat in there. Here comes the radio. Okay, let's watch the scope there as I turn it up. At the top of the volume control, the volume cuts out. The, uh, the control has a dead spot right at the top. Norm normally, nobody turns the volume control to the top, so it doesn't really matter. It's still not very loud, is it? No. Okay, it still doesn't look 100% balanced between the bottom and the top, but it looks better. Uh, let's try FM. Let's see what happens with FM here. I need a good strong signal. Seems weaker. I have the volume up full. Ooh, what's that? That's that's this thing that's right around 100. Uh, I don't know what it is in my house that does that. Wow. Can you see that on the? Yeah, you can see the whole line goes up and down. Is I imagine that's an AVC voltage or something. I don't know what that is. Not helping us though. Well, let me take the signal generator off the antenna here, just just in case that somehow is affecting things. Well, we 
seem to have lost the FM basically here. I really have this turned up. That's all there is to it. Looks like it's distorted the other way now. I need a bigger signal. I don't see the distortion anymore. It's still very, very weak. Let's try another two. I got a couple more. Let's try another one. I think it's a long shot that it would help. Okay, I'll pull this one out. Okay, so, so oh no, I'm going to mix all these tubes up. Okay, so that's the original. I can't, I can't mix that up. It's a very big tube. And this is the one I just put in. And let's try another one of these here. Now one of these I can see clearly. This one. 6T8. So we're going to put this one in. The, uh, the other tube, it's a little questionable about what the tube number is on it. I think it's a 6. So we do have another one yet. A third one. This kind of socket, if the tube pins are slightly bent, they really have a hard time getting the uh, tube in, which may be the case here. All these pins, they all look bent in slightly. It's kind of weird. How would that happen? rolling around in a tube box for 25 years maybe. Maybe the pins get beat in after a while. That looks perfect. Let's try that. bent pins and that flat type of socket. Okay, let's, let's let her rip again. Well, you know what? I had this on restricted power, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, ooh, what's going on on the scope there? It's not looking very good. There we go. Start look kind of weird. Now this was tuned to a station. Okay, I'm gonna put this on full. Wipe it right out. I don't like that. Don't like the look of that. Let's go back to the uh, rip first replacement tube again and try it on full. So this, yeah, you help me remember what I'm doing with these tubes. <clears throat> I'm gonna plug this guy back in. see that strange hump here. Let's see. No, it didn't really develop, did it? Oh, that's interesting. 
don't know what it was. Something to do with the diode detector part of the tube, I don't know. Okay, so we're, we're back to where we were. Let's put full power on here. Tune in something. There's that whopper signal. Where'd the reception go? I had more volume with the second replacement. There's that weird thing. Uh, let's put the original back in. I'm pretty sure somewhere I have a bunch more of these tubes. Sometimes you can tell the mileage on a tube by the kind of black deposits you might see inside the tube, in the glass, on the uh, metal parts and that. This one's showing a few, but I did notice one of my other 19T8s was really blackened. And just popping the tube in here. There it goes. Power back on. Can't remember now if we can. Let, let, well, it'd be good to see that distortion again at this point. Good for me. There's no multiple humps again at all. Okay, full voltage here. Tune in. Okay, the huh, the huh that just came out of me was me tuning through the uh, through the signal and noticing that this flat limit actually can be moved from the top to the bottom. And there's a, a great deal of time where there doesn't appear to be any distortion. This is really telling me something about this radio. Let's watch it again. Make it a little more sensitive here. That looked pretty good, didn't it? Let's go through that loud signal again. So, oh, it's really subtle. It's really not easy to see this. Uh, I think it may be an FM alignment issue here that we're really struggling with. That's what I'm thinking now. Um, so if somebody has uh, adjusted the IF alignment, <clears throat> weakened the whole radio, we're fighting against this weak signal, that's why I need the volume up all the time. And if they monkeyed uh, even by accident with some of the FM uh, demodulator settings, then we could get I think this kind of effect, this exact kind of effect. And so I'm sort of laying off the idea of a bad tube now, although clearly putting different tubes in, you, you get a different different response. I mean, this is like three tubes in one, so three times the trouble. Um, <clears throat> so from here, it's an alignment issue. Yikes. Uh, wow. I'm just going to show you why I'm going yikes and wow here. Okay, so here's some of the adjustments here. One, they're all waxed. One, two, three, four, 
five. Uh, I bet you there's nine more in here somewhere. Five. All waxed up. <clears throat> These may or may not be adjustments in the FM demodulator. Excuse me. <coughs> or they could just be more RF adjustments in the radio for tuning the antenna system and stuff like that. How am I going to know? How am I possibly going to know what the heck is what in here? Uh, look at it. What a battle this would be to try to do this. First, just identifying where the adjustment even is. Am I even? Is it even here? Because I suspect some of these adjustments. I mean, look at the IF can. Look at how hot that tube is, man. That tube is just screaming hot. Whew. Let me just. I'll measure it in a second. So we see two adjustments there, one there, and another one up here. And for the life of me, I can't remember, but I suspect some of these could be. Could be FM adjustments. Uh, I'm gonna have to dig up some kind of information about this radio somewhere, somehow. But uh, I think that's where we're gonna stop here at the moment, because another beautiful day outside, and you know there are fossils to be found and stuff like that. Hey, maybe someday I'll be a fossil. Somebody will dig me up 400 million years from now. Isn't that a weird thought? really weird. Okay, so thanks for watching so far, and uh, see you on the next, uh, next video on this radio.